We begin the respiratory system by looking at the anatomy of the respiratory system. We begin the discussion of the anatomy of the respiratory system by looking at the requirements of the respiratory system, one of which is adequate surface area. So the greater the surface area, then the greater the site for potential gas exchange. And the two gases that we will be focusing on will be carbon dioxide and oxygen. When we look at our lungs, we will see that we have these microscopic sacs in which our lungs are made up of, which we refer to as alveolar sacs. And what I'm circling right now at the bottom right-hand corner is one alveolar sac. This is what our lungs are made up of. So having these alveolar sacs will greatly increase the surface area. The second requirement is an adequate transport system. When we were talking about blood, we learned that oxygen has a very low solubility in water. Well, water makes up most of the fluid component of blood, which of course is referred to as plasma. Therefore, oxygen needs a transporter, it needs a carrier, and that of course is your mature red blood cell called erythrocyte. So within the erythrocyte, we have 250 million hemoglobins that will interact with oxygen to deliver this oxygen to the tissue cells. And in turn, our tissue cells will produce carbon dioxide. Well, it turns out that some of that carbon dioxide can also be transported by this erythrocyte. The third requirement is adequate protection. Our lung is a very delicate tissue. So one way to protect it is to line it with mucous membranes. And the mucosa, the most superficial part of the mucous membrane, consists of epithelial tissue. And among those epithelial tissue will be goblet cells. And of course, these goblet cells are what produces the mucus. In addition to the mucous membranes, we have wandering macrophages called alveolar macrophage or dust cells. So these are phagocytic cells, part of our immune cells that patrol our entire respiratory tract, ready to engulf anything that potentially can make us sick. The fourth requirement is adequate moisture. And that moisture is provided by mucus. And our respiratory tract has a thin layer of mucus that provides this moisture. In addition to mucus, we have a very important fluid produced within the lung called surfactant. We will talk about the importance of surfactant when we look at the physiology of the respiratory system. This surfactant, by the way, will allow for the lungs to expand and recoil each and every time we breathe in and breathe out. Let's now look at the division of the respiratory system. So we have what's called the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. The upper respiratory tract begins at the nose down to the larynx, while the lower respiratory tract begins at the trachea down to the lungs. When we look at the next slide, we will look at another way to classify or to divide the respiratory system. So in the first slide, we looked at the structural classification of the respiratory system, whereby we divided it into the upper respiratory tract, beginning at the nose and ending at the larynx, and the lower respiratory tract, beginning at the trachea, ending with the lungs. So let's now look at another way to classify the respiratory system, and that is the functional organization or the functional classification, where we have what's referred to as the conducting zone, which includes the nose all the way down to the lungs, specifically at the terminal bronchiole. Now, when we get to the microscopic anatomy of the lungs, we'll look at these terminal bronchioles, so hopefully by then it'll make more sense. The other part of the functional organization is the respiratory zone that encompasses the respiratory bronchiole, which is found in the lungs, to the alveolus. And once again, we'll look at the microscopic anatomy of the lungs. This conducting zone 
is a conduit or a passageway for airflow. Each and every time we breathe in and out, the conducting zone is where that air will travel through while the respiratory zone is the site where exchange of gases occurs, oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen from the air that we breathe in and carbon dioxide produced by our tissue cells. Now, one thing I wanna point out with this image that you see in front of you, and that is the upper respiratory tract. Please make sure that that upper respiratory track includes the nose to the larynx, okay? So I don't want you to get this confused. While the lower respiratory track is from the trachea to the lungs. So let's begin with the upper respiratory system or the upper respiratory track, which includes the nose, the paranasal sinuses, the pharynx, and the larynx. The nose and the paranasal sinuses will be the first part of the upper respiratory tract that we will be focusing on, and then we'll look at the pharynx and the larynx. So the function of the nose will be to provide an airway for respiration, it moistens and warms the entering air or the air that we breathe in, and it also filters and cleans the air that we breathe in. It also serves as a resonating chamber for speech. This is why when you have a congested nose, it affects your voice or the sound of your voice. It also is where we find the olfactory receptors. These olfactory receptors are involved in the sense of smell. Now our nose is divided into two regions. We have the external nose, and that is the portion of the respiratory system that we actually can see, which is made up of the bony framework and the cartilaginous framework. So the bony framework includes the frontal bone, the nasal bones, and the maxilla. While the cartilaginous framework includes the two lateral nasal cartilages, the septal cartilage, and the alar cartilage. As far as the type of cartilage that makes up this cartilaginous framework, they are all hyaline cartilage. Now, if we go back to the image on the left, what I want to point out is what's called the external nares, also referred to as the anterior nares. Basically, this is our nostril. So this is where air, when we breathe in, flows into, and when we breathe out, air obviously flows out of that external nares, also once again referred to as the anterior nares, commonly called our nostrils. The second region of the nose is the nasal cavity, the part of our nose that we do not see. It begins from the nasal vestibule to the internal nares, which has AKA names such as the posterior nasal aperture and the coana. We are just gonna to refer to it as the internal nares, which by the way, is also sometimes referred to as the posterior nares. So if we look at the nasal vestibule, which marks the entry into the nasal cavity, it is the pocket that is created by the alar cartilages that we identified in the previous slide. So if we look at this picture of this man, that pocket right there is the nasal vestibule. And leading into that nasal vestibule will be our external nares again, commonly known as our nostril. Well, it turns out that we have two nasal cavities, one on the right and one on the left. And the reason being is because we have what's called the nasal septum. So if we look at the nasal septum, we have our septal cartilage, which is right here. And that septal cartilage is hyaline cartilage. Now, the bony part of the nasal septum will be the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone and the vomer. So our nasal septum is part cartilage and part bone. So this partition, this wall, is what creates the two nasal cavities that we have, one on the right and one on the left. 
when we go deeper into this nasal cavity beyond the nasal vestibule, what we find are conchi. So these nasal conchi are folds of bone tissue, which will be lined with respiratory mucosa. We'll talk about that in the next slide. So these nasal conchi are foldings of bone tissue, which again will be lined with mucosa. The point being is that for every nasal concha, we will have a corresponding nasal meatus. So a meatus is an opening that goes through bone. So once again, for every nasal concha, we will have a corresponding nasal meatus. So when we look at the nasal conchi, we have the superior nasal concha and the superior nasal meatus, which again is an opening through that bone. It's a tube-like tunnel type of opening. And we have a middle nasal concha, therefore we have a middle nasal meatus. We have an inferior nasal concha, Therefore, we have an inferior nasal meatus. And there's a reason why we have these foldings, because this will create turbulence that will help moisten the air, will help filter the air, and also will help warm the air. Now, when we pass these nasal conchi and their corresponding meatus, we leave the nasal cavity through another opening called the internal nares. So this internal nares marks the point in which we now leave the nasal cavity and move into the next part of the upper respiratory tract. And once again, this internal nares can sometimes be referred to as the posterior nares. Let's now talk about the two types of mucous membrane that lines the nasal cavity. We have the olfactory mucosa and the respiratory mucosa. The olfactory mucosa is found in the superior region of our nasal cavity. In fact, when we look at the superior nasal conchi, this is where we would find the olfactory mucosa and the type of epithelial tissue will be olfactory epithelium, which is associated with the sense of smell. The region of the nasal cavity where we find this olfactory mucosa is referred to as the olfactory region. The second type of mucous membrane is the respiratory mucosa, and the type of epithelial tissue that we find is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium with scattered goblet cells. And of course, these goblet cells secrete mucus. And the location of the nasal cavity where we find the respiratory mucosa would of course be the respiratory region. And if we just quickly look at the nasal cavity and these two types of mucous membranes, I think everyone can agree that a majority of the mucosa is respiratory mucosa. Now, I just wanna quickly talk about the olfactory mucosa and its location. So the roof of the nasal cavity is, again, associated with the olfactory mucosa. In fact, it's found along the floor of the ethmoid bone. And resting on that ethmoid bone will be the olfactory bulb. So that olfactory bulb rests on that ethmoid bone and is in direct contact with that olfactory mucosa. And this olfactory bulb, of course, is associated with cranial nerve number two, the olfactory nerve, which is associated with the sense of smell. And just to recap what we talked about in the previous slide, we have the nasal vestibule that leads into the nasal conchi and the associated nasal meatus. And when we want to leave the nasal cavity, then we pass through another opening called the internal nares that leads into the pharynx, which will be the next component of the upper respiratory tract. Let's look at the respiratory mucosa in more detail. And just to quickly review what the mucosa consists of, we have the superficial epithelial tissue, which is made up of pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, 
which is anchored to the basement membrane. And deep to the basement membrane is the lamina propria, which is areolar connective tissue. So the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium have these cilia in order to sweep the contaminated mucus posteriorly towards the throat. And the idea here is we either cough it up or we spit it out. Now the air that we breathe in will be worn by plexuses or networks of capillaries in veins found in the nasal cavity. These capillaries and veins are found primarily in the lamina propria, the areolar connective tissue part of the mucosa. We also have many sensory nerve endings which will trigger the sneeze reflex. And that sneeze reflex can be located in the medulla oblongata. So let's now look at some of these images. We have, of course, the ciliated pseudostratified epithelia with the cilia. We will also have a very thin layer of mucus. And the idea by having these hair-like structures is to sweep the foreign matter or foreign particles that we so happen to inhale towards the pharynx, which is the next component of the respiratory tract, the upper respiratory tract. And we can't forget the goblet cells. It's responsible for that thin layer of mucus. Now, I notice that these images have ciliated columnar epithelial cells. Please take note, it is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. It is not ciliated columnar. So please make that correction with these two images. And here is the lamina propria, where we're gonna find the network of capillaries and veins in the nasal cavity. Now, in addition to the goblet cells, we have what are called seromucus or seromucosal glands that contain two different types of cells that secrete different types of fluids. So let's first look at the serous cells. So these serous cells secrete a more watery fluid. In other words, it's not so thick as mucus that will contain some enzymes. We also have the mucus cells, which are very similar to the goblet cells in the sense that they secrete mucus. Now, between the mucus and the serous secretions, they contain lysozyme defensins, which are antibacterial substances, and immunoglobulin A. These immunoglobulins are found primarily in bodily fluids. In this case, the secretions of the mucus and the serous cells. So if we look at the image over here, the primary area we find the serous and mucus cells will be found in the lamina propria. So these are exocrine glands, and the idea is these exocrine glands will secrete their secretions that will end up on the surface of the respiratory mucosa. I also made an illustration over here just to make sure that we're clear on the mucosal layer. We have the epithelial layer anchored to a basement membrane, and this area right here, which I labeled number three, is a lamina propria. So once again, this is where we find the secretory part of the seromucosal glands, the serous cells and the mucous cells that are secreting their components. If we have inflammation of this nasal mucosa or respiratory mucosa, then that's referred to as rhinitis. So this nasal mucosa is continuous with the mucosa of the rest of the respiratory tract. Therefore, any infection in this nasal cavity can easily spread to the rest of the respiratory tract, and it can make its way down into the lungs, where now we potentially can have pneumonia. Furthermore, the infection can spread into the tear ducts and the paranasal sinuses.